Hey everybody, it's Galmanax, and welcome back to some more Magic Green, and today we're going to be playing another premiere draft of the Lost Caverns of Ixalan. Without further ado, let's just slam dunk our big rare dinosaur, our two for one, it's a 7-6 trample, and we discover five when we play it, casting another spell. It's flexible, it's being able to be a removal spell with that three mana instant speed discard effect. It's just easily the best card in the pack, and we're going to move on to our pick two. Pick number two has some excellent cards in this pack as well, some premium uncommons like the little evasive threats, the deep cavern bat, a flying lifelinker that rips a card out of your opponent's hand, and the spyglass siren, a one mana one one flyer that gives you a map token for some good value. I'm going to go for the siren over the deep cavern bat. I prefer blue red quite a bit to red black. I think red black is one of the weaker color pairs in the format. You need to get a lot of great descended synergies for it to do too much, and red is like one of the best aggressive colors, whereas black does not have very much aggro stuff at all, so I think the colors just don't pair super well together, so while the bat and the siren are relatively comparably powerful, I think blue is just a stronger color in the set in general, and a much stronger color to pair with red. So spyglass siren for pick number two. As we move on to pick three, we've got a cogwork wrestler, another great one mana play. Being able to flash this in, give something minus two minus zero, can often just win a combat for you. Let you keep a creature on board while you kill one of your opponent's creatures. So can kind of be like a removal spell and a creature all in one, which can be pretty nasty. So I do like the Cogwork Wrestler a lot. Also being an artifact is very, very relevant for a lot of synergies in the format. So we'll take the Wrestler here. Other reasonable options are the Cenote Scout as probably just... One of the best individual cards in the pack, regardless of color. Just great value for that one mana, similar to our Siren. There's not much outside of that, though. Maybe we do actually potentially take the Dowsing Device at that point. If you get a really artifact-heavy deck, this can get a bunch of extra haste damage in, and then flip into this land that can keep getting additional damage in as well. So it's kind of fun. Um, I've never played it before. I wouldn't recommend taking it super highly, but I think the rest of this pack is weak enough. It's actually in the running. Pick number four now. Have not been very impressed by Rumbling Rock Slide in this format, when a lot of the best cards are little cheap value plays, like one drops and two drops that explore, or give you a map token, or give you a 1 1 token, or have a good enter the battlefield effect. Because then your Rumbling Rock, rock Slide in a lot of matchups ends up trading down mana wise and it's trading into cards that probably gave your opponent some additional amount of value even if you kill them. So Rock Slide's played pretty poorly. Unlucky Drop, also kind of expensive for what it's doing, but at least this one is instant speed, and it hits a little bit more than just creatures. But I don't think we're taking that either. There's another Deep Cavern Bat, or there's a Tinker's Tote here for really solid off-color options. I think those are the two best cards in the pack. I do like blue-white artifacts and crafting quite a bit, and Tinker's Tote works well for that. Blue-black is really kind of a descend sort of archetype, where I don't actually think our first couple blue picks are super good for that kind of blue-black deck, so we'll take the Tote towards white. Pick five now, another Rumbling Rock Slide. Not particularly exciting. There's a Hidden Cataract we can play if we don't end up with a ton of 1-mana cards. If we end up with a whole bunch of stuff to do at 1-mana, then having to play a tap land at some point in the game is actually going to be a hindrance can stop our, our curve from being doled out on the correct turns. We don't really want to do that. Cosmium Blast is fine filler removal. Council of Echoes has actually been an okay card at the top end of the curve pretty consistently. Um, it's relatively consistent to have four permanents in your grave by the time you cast this with just a little bit of work, just trading off your cheap creatures, as well as having a couple inverted icebergs or map tokens or something. I think I'll actually just cut more blue out of the pack and take the Council of Echoes here for the top of the curve. Pick six, nothing good in red. There's Waterlogged Hulk for blue-black descend, milling yourself a bunch, so that once you have eight permanents in grave, this flips into this really nice unblockable vehicle. So that's pretty impressive. But Waylaying Pirates is good in pretty much every blue deck, whereas the Hulk I really only like in the blue-black one, where you get a lot of value from that self-mill. So I think I'm going to take the Pirates over the Hulk for flexibility. Pick number seven, River Herald Scout, is super solid filler for any blue deck. Don't mind if I do. Cosmium Blast, probably the next best card to take, or the Cartographer's Companion here, just because it's colorless. So we can put it in as filler on anything we end up playing, not that it'll be super impressive. 
pick eight, Vanguard of the Rose can actually be kind of impressive with some random map tokens, gnome tokens, treasure tokens, anything like that to sacrifice towards it. So that's pretty nice pickup towards blue white. Pick number nine. There is another Cartographer's Companion for decent filler. Gives us two permanents to sack for cards like Vanguard of the Rose. Two different artifacts for crafting. It's got a lot of little synergies that add up well, and neither of these red cards are premium. Red might be cut off enough to not go for the Carnosaur. The only okay red cards we've been seeing have been Rumbling Rock Slides and Combat Tricks. That's kind of the only thing we've seen in the color. Which is not a good sign for it being open. Pick number 10, we do see a Dinosaurus on this time. But we've got a couple pirates already for the pirate hat to just be one mana to equip, where it is actually pretty solid. Kind of a filler card, but I think equipment do play decently well in this format with cheap flyers like Spyglass Siren. Take the pirate hat here over the waterlogged Hulk mainly. Hoping to stick to a more aggressive blue deck rather than the really grindy kind of blue-black deck that is available. Take like a promising vein. I don't think we're going to end up being able to splash in this Carnosaur, but I guess it's moderately possible if I get a ton of promising vein and compass gnome style cards, but splashing in a double red card is going to be real difficult. I guess the plus side of this is that even if you only have one red source, it's a 3-mana instant to deal 3 to a creature. So it does always have a perfectly playable backup plan. Not always, but as long as we have one red source, it has a perfectly playable backup plan. Alright, get one of these waterlogged hulks last pick, but I don't think black's been super open. So I don't think we're going to be a Waterlogged Hulk Descend deck today. Alright, it's pack to pick number one. Nothing good in blue, nothing good in white, which means we take something speculative towards red. Atali's favor a fine card for really aggressive red decks, or we take something speculative towards black, with Souls of the Lost, which can just be a really big creature for the mana cost. When you're filling your grave potentially with self-mill cards like the Waterlogged Hulk in that kind of archetype. Get a lot of permanents in there. You can discard or sacrifice one when you play this, so it's at least like a 1-2 when it hits the board. Yeah, it has to be a speculative pick here no matter what, because these on-color cards are just not... <laughs> they're not pick one worthy. So I'm actually going to speculate towards black over red... Uh, since we did get that Waterlogged Hulk super late, we can probably get some blue Descend kind of cards pretty late, even if we don't get a ton of black, and I don't think we're getting a ton of red either with how the first pack went. So let's grab the Souls of the Lost. For pack 2, pick 2, there's an Inverted Iceberg. Really solid card for any blue deck, blue crafting stuff, blue Descend stuff, anything like that. There's a Staunch Crewmate, which is good if we can have a really high artifact and or pirate count. Currently, that's two pirates and six artifacts. That's eight cards this can draw into. It's already pretty much there. Like, ten is where I want for this to be really consistent. And if it is really consistent, it's a two-mana two-one that draws you a non-land card at the top four. Like, it draws you action every time. I'm actually going to take the Crewmate over the Iceberg here, but I do not think the Iceberg will come back. I don't think anything good in this pack will come back. The only good cards being Skullcap Snail, sort of, Inverted Iceberg, and Sunshaw Militia. So, I mean, these should dry up real quick. I guess Queen's Bay Paladin is fine for black-white, but... That's not exactly where we're headed here. Okay, I mean, we're only two cards deep into white, so we're not necessarily married to blue-white here. We can take a Cogwork Wrestler since it'll make the cut no matter what, or we can push deeper into black alongside our Souls of the Lost uh, with a Bitter Triumph, or deeper into red alongside our Carnosaur with a Goblin Tomb Raider or a Volatile Wanderglyph. The nice part about trying to jump deeper into red is it finds us another card that our staunch crewmate can dig out of our deck. 
so it makes the crewmate even stronger. So that's pretty spicy. But taking the Cogwork Wrestler also puts another card in this deck that the crewmate can grab, and it fits into the deck no matter what. I'll take the Wrestler here. Pack two, pick four. Okay, well, we're going to play blue-red, I guess. We'll take the Captain Storm here, and we'll just have to take decent red playables incredibly highly. This card is just super, super busted, especially with a staunch crewmate to be able to pull it out of your deck. But with a decent artifact or map token count at all, this is just a ton of power for the mana cost. It's an absurd card, as is the Carnosaur. So now we're just going to be trying really hard to have just a few red cards to shove these two mega bombs into the deck. So at this point we can take that inverted iceberg, going to be super playable in blue-red. It's going to be our six drop finisher that's also some good value early. Speaking of cards that are super playable in this archetype, I don't have basically any full-on removal right now, so we could take Idol of the Deep King, which is fine. It is an artifact. Three mana for two damage isn't great, but then this also flips into an equipment to get extra damage in, especially if you can throw this onto a flyer. It ends up playing pretty well, but I just really, really, really like Plundering Pirate. When I curve into it off of a Captain Storm, we can also pull it out of our deck with Crewmate. It also helps get the second red source for Carnosaur. I think Plundering Pirate looks pretty sweet here. Pick number seven, Careening Minecart also actually looks pretty sweet in this deck, spitting out those treasure tokens turn after turn so that we have some ways to ramp into the Carnosaur as well as consistent artifact tokens hitting the board to function alongside our cards like Captain Storm and some of our crafting cards. I think the Minecart seems pretty great. It's a great use for our cog work wrestlers that end up just sitting on the board later. Now we could take mediocre removal like Rumbling Rock Slide just because we don't have interaction, or we just grab a four mana artifact creature. Makes our crewmate even more consistent. Works with our artifact onto the battlefield stuff. I'm just going to take a Dinatomaton here. No removal might not be a problem if we just play really aggressively and then lock down our opponent's blockers with Waylaying Pirate style cards. Now there's a Compass Gnome or Brine Fang, neither are particularly good. Let's take another Compass Gnome, I guess. Pick number 10. We've got multiple cards spitting out multiple permanents off of the one thing, like Companion, Spyglass, Siren, Careening Minecart and stuff, so Sunshot Militia could actually get a good amount of damage in for us. We got the Goblin Tomb Raider pick 11. Excellent little aggro dork that can also be pulled out of our deck with the crewmate. We can put counters on it with Captain Storm. That was a huge pickup. All right. We got one more pack to improve this deck, and we already have 22 playables. Pretty happy with how things are looking. I think we take just really solid, really efficient removal over anything else, but there is none in this pack, so we'll just take another Goblin Tomb Raider for hyper aggro. Pirates nonsense. Tidebinder has been fine. I've played it once before. Definitely could have been better than the way I played it. Because I didn't fully comprehend how this ability worked. Um, but even if I played it like perfectly there, I think it was just solid. Because there are some times where it just sits in your hand waiting. Um, or you just flash out a 3 mana 3 2, which is not a good deal. Uh, if you're not getting the enter the battlefield effect, so... I mean, it's a fine card, it's perfectly solid, but 1 mana 2-2 two, two haste is just so, so, so overstatted for the mana cost, and it's a great creature type for us as well. Speaking of things that are overstatted for the cost, unfortunately, again, opened up no solid removal on color, but we did find a Zoetic Glyph, which we can use to make a Cogwork Wrestler, a map token. Maybe we end up running the Compass Gnomes just because they're artifacts at this point. We can make any of those cards 5-4s that discover when they die to cast another spell, Zoetic Glyph is a pretty absurd card that I'm happy to take. Pack three, pick number three. I am low enough on interaction, I think, to go ahead and play the kind of dirtily eaten by piranhas just to shut off a really good creature, make it a 1-1 with no abilities. So if their creature has a scary ability that's doing a lot of great work, we can make it not have that ability anymore. And if it's just a big blocker or a big scary attacker, we just make it a 1-1. Card plays perfectly fine. We'll take the Eaten by Piranhas here over a third wrestler. 
just for more interaction. That is a pick four spyglass siren, which we can pull out of our deck with our staunch crewmate, as well as just being an excellent one drop. Really happy to see that. I don't think we get this inverted iceberg back, but maybe we can get a dinatomaton back or something moderately playable. Easy spyglass siren, though. What a pickup here. Oh, wow. Yeah, we're finding excellent stuff. Now we get our first Water Wind Scout at three mana. Another one of these cards that makes two permanents off one card. So it works great with Sunshine Militia. Gives us an artifact, so it works great with Captain Storm. Works great with Zoetic Glyph, all that kind of stuff. It's just an excellent, excellent roll filler for this deck. Pick number six now has basically nothing for us. Could play a Captivating Cave that we can sacrifice to get some counters on a flyer at some point. The filtering of the mana is not a very impressive ability to have, though. But there's nothing else in this pack we'll end up playing, so... I think we could probably play a Captivating Cave. We basically never want to have to use the second ability. Because then, you know, if I have three mountains and a Captivating Cave, that means I don't get to play my Waterwind Scout to like, turn four. So having to play off curve to get the extra man of any color out of it is rough. We don't really ever want to do that. So sometimes it's going to punish us by being a colorless land. But it can also get us out of mana flood pretty well, buffing up whatever creature it's going to be advantageous to do so. Pack three, pick seven. Good lord. A third goblin tomb raider. Don't mind if I do. We're going to have to call this deck no interaction, no problem. Because we've got very little when it comes to actually dealing with the stuff that our opponents resolve. But hopefully we just outspeed them with so many premium one-drops. Four of which put an artifact on the board for the triple Tomb Raider. Good lord, this is crazy. And we get a pick eight belligerent yearling? Sure, it's not an artifact or a pirate or anything, but it's a two mana three two trample, which is a great aggressive stat line. Might be worth taking a blunder just to have another bounce spell to try to slow our opponent down. But I'm just going to take the massive dork for the cost and cut the triple gnome here. That mana cost. Okay, now we've got another yearling. I mean, I have like 19 creatures in here. I still have to cut some more creatures. I don't know if I go double yearling over taking a puzzle door here because it puts another artifact in our deck and it gives us a little more flexibility rather than just having all creatures. Okay, this time I will go puzzle door over the yearling. If I'd remembered that first yearling and I was convinced that I was going to wield that one as well, I think it would have been better to have one blunder and one yearling than one puzzle door and one yearling. I've got a few dinos in here. Lattice is probably a little better than another puzzle door. Now a hidden volcano. I'm not playing six mana removal in a deck this aggressive. Even if it doesn't have enough removal, I don't care. I'm not making it to six mana, ideally. Unlucky drop is fine. Four mana and instant speed. Get something out of the way. Alright, so we have 40... Five cards right now, which is a ton. We get to cut five cards out of this deck with triple Tomb Raider and a Captain Storm with this kind of insane little aggro nonsense going on. We probably just want to play to the board a lot, just slam a ton of creatures out. I'm actually kind of okay with the quality of our creatures being so much higher than our non-creatures. I'm going to go for a really creature-heavy deck here just because I think our, our cheap creature spells are a lot better than some of these more filler non-creature spells. And we can just try to steamroll our opponent in the early game, keeping as many 1, 2, 3 mana creatures in this deck as possible. So I'm just going to keep all these in here, I think, and cut out like the 6-drop Council of Echoes, the kind of 5-drop creature of Sahili's Lattice here immediately. Don't really care too much about the Puzzle Door card draw, and then maybe the Double Pirate Hat. Better to just slam more creatures down early than give one plus one plus one slowly for three mana total. Two to play this, one to equip. Takes a little while to get that going. Yeah, let's just go all in on just slam in here, I think. But actually, I mean, I could cut a land with this many one and two drop cards. Average mana cost is 2.3, and I can use the Carnosaur at three mana. I can use the Iceberg at two. 
So I think actually we can probably keep one pirate hat in here and uh, and cut one land. I'm actually going to cut the captivating cave here and just have all the correct colors of mana. And if we flood out, we've got one hidden volcano. I mean, this many one drops, though. I don't actually think I want any non-basics. I don't want any tap lands, and I want to have all the colored mana I need at all times to dump everything in my hand onto the board. Right, because we can easily imagine scenarios with this deck where on turn three, we have a two drop and a one drop still in the hand, right? Like I, I turn one, play like a Tomb Raider or a Spyglass Siren. Turn two, play a Yearling or something. And then it's possible turn three, maybe I have like a Pirate Hat and a Wrestler in hand or something. And it's like I need double blue and one. Or maybe I have a Sunshot Militia and a Tomb Raider in hand still. And I need double red and one. In these scenarios, having just one colorless land like that cave in there could be pretty rough for us. And those scenarios can pop up quite a lot when we have seven one-drop spells. Like, you can just fill that in at any point in the curve, right? When you have three mana, having a two-drop and a one-drop. When you have four mana, having a three-drop and a one-drop. When you have five mana, having a four-drop and a one-drop. So on. Just this many one-drops in the deck does make having colorless sources a little weaker. Because having double blue or double red to be able to play two red spells or two blue spells in one turn is actually pretty nice and obviously in a deck this aggressive we don't want to be playing off curve to get the second color of that source we don't want to have to spend four mana total to cast three mana worth of spells like you would have to do with the filtering on the captivating cave so we'll cut our lands like that we'll run no tap lands and no colorless lands We'll see that we have 14 blue cards and 9 red, but triple important red drop. I think I'm still going to go 50-50 split on this one. Even with uh, a bit more blue spells than red spells, because we have just as many kind of early red spells as early blue spells. And we don't really... And we've got one double blue and one double red, so it is pretty important the vast majority of, time, of the time for us to have one source of each color. So I'm going to lean in on that and try to have an even amount of both, despite there being a little more blue than red yeah that's going to be the mana base and that's going to be the deck we will call it a deck here all right here we have a look at the completed deck list for today we're on a blue red pirates and artifacts hyper aggro build here with three potential one mana two twos with haste two of the spyglass sirens spitting on a map token maybe getting counters on themselves some cogwork wrestlers to ruin combat for our opponent we have the Captain Storm to dump some counters onto our pirates, the staunch crewmate to stay ahead in card advantage, a lot of the really excellent, really cheap creatures for the archetype, as well as the big bomb of the trumpeting carnosaur at the very top of the curve. So really explosive stuff here and really aggressive stuff here. We are trying to go full hyper aggro. We don't have a ton of interaction. Just one eaten by piranhas, one unlucky drop, but hopefully we have enough really, really cheap creatures to curve out and do some wild things before our opponent finds their big cards to stabilize with. So pretty self-explanatory, but very powerful deck today. Excited to see how it does as we head into the gameplay. Here we are for game one, and this is hopefully going to be our least aggressive hand of the day because we're trying to be the hyper aggro deck, but this is still a really good hand because it absolutely has a game plan. When we have the trumpeting Carnosaur at the top of the curve alongside multiple ways, to spit out treasure tokens, the Plundering Pirate and the Careening Minecart. There's the Goblin Tomb Raider, so I can turn three haste that out alongside an Iceberg if I want. For now, let's get the crewmate down. We find a Cogwork Wrestler. A little rough to have to reveal that, but obviously still much better than drawing nothing. And it is really gross against a Death Toucher like the Marionette. They're going to have to constantly play around the Wrestler and realize that their Death Toucher is just not going to do what they want it to do. Okay. So now I can haste out the Tomb Raider while still holding up the Cogwork Wrestler, because we drew the Spyglass Siren, so... Let's go ahead and do that. I am choosing not... To spit out a treasure this turn by doing this though, which means it's going to take a little longer before we get to the Carnosaur, but I think it is super worth it to beat down this hard this early. Alright, so they will get the Cogwork Wrestler out of the way here. But we get to kill the Marionette without losing a creature, so the Wrestler still does excellent work for us. This board state is insane if they do not have a board wipe, but they are 
in the kind of archetype that can have multiple, they've got three caves on board, and there's a red cave board wipe. Deals damage to all creatures equal to the number of um, caves that they have on board and in grave. And they could also have the double black and one, give everything minus two, minus two. Those are both uncommon board wipes. So I don't think I want to put any more creatures on board now if I can... Uh, if I can avoid it, so we can just like play the careening minecart this turn, or we can go iceberg and crack a map. I think that's also pretty reasonable. Yeah, see if we can naturally draw land, that would be helpful. Either off of the map token or the iceberg. So let's go for the map token first, so we might get extra damage in. Although this plays a little poorly against instant speed removal. Because they can counter our explore. All right, well, we didn't hit a land yet, but by milling that companion, we might be closer to maybe hit it off the Iceberg. I mean, I guess Iceberg is going to mill the next card as well. All right, still find a land, though, which is beautiful. We will play our land for turn, but that's all. We'll just attack with everybody now and see what they've got. Maybe their own Cogwork Wrestler. Try to get some blocks here. It would be reasonable. They could uh, trade into the crewmate. Well, not even trade. They could just kill the crewmate. Without losing the wrestler. But they don't have that. They grab an island, I think, off the, the cave thing. And they drop a gargantuan leech. Which is a giant lifelinker. Which is a big, big deal. So now I might have to ditch the Carnosaur just to get the Lifelinker off of their board. Does feel somewhat likely. Let's see, is there any way this goes poorly for me? If they specifically block Cogwork Wrestler, I can't kill the Leech this turn. Find it highly unlikely that they will choose to do that, though. I guess they could to play around a braid. That is the common red removal spell that's popular. Two mana, instant speed, three damage. Yeah, they might play around a braid, so let's not send in the wrestler. Because that would also play around the Carnosaur. Alright. So we clear out that lifelinker at least. Get another map token. Deadweight the Siren. These are not the kind of plays you'd make if you had the board wipe in hand, so we're happy with that. But the defossilize on the Gargantuan Leech. It's a really bad one for us. We have got to find one of our two pieces of interaction here. I guess the Zoetic Glyph's a pretty good draw. I can crack the map token and play the Zoetic Glyph this turn. Go for a double block on this leech. I could also keep the map token and put the glyph onto it. That way I still have the iceberg to flip into a 6-6 later, since it looks like this game might actually grind out. Yeah. Opponent's getting some pretty good stalling going on here, so let's actually put it on the map token so we grind out a long game better. Really hoping for no instant speed removal from our opponent. Because that would ruin our double block. I think we still kind of have to do it. Rather than letting them drain us for 7, that's a 14 life point swing. I don't have enough blockers that putting the wrestler here changes this math at all. If they have the combat trick... Or the removal spell to like minus two the crewmate or blow up the crewmate or the five four. I'm not going to kill Leech even if I put Wrestler into this block two. All right, we do get the trade, and now we discover <laughs> the eaten by piranhas. A little late, but I'll keep you in hand. I guess we stop the uh, stop them from reanimating the giant life linker now. Or we can make the 4-4-1-1 four, four, one, one if we want. And they are really getting there, though, with this Caves deck. They have the Benthasar as well for just a 4-4 four, four plus draw two. Massively stable board from our opponent. Actually kind of insane. 
All right. So here's not doing anything now. Set up a plundering pirate to have a treasure at the ready for the iceberg later. Or I could play militia plus pirate hat. I could pirate hat up the siren and try to draw lands. I guess that's fine. It speeds up my clock a little bit if they don't get more lifelinkers. And if they do, we probably just save the eaten by piranhas for lifelinkers. Okay, we do find the land we need, so we ditch the minecart. 3-3 three, three doesn't matter against the 4-4. Four, four. I think so. And cast the Sunshot Militia. Rather chump with Wrestler than Militia, but I'm also just not going to chump this turn anyway, so... Do the double shoot. Down to 16. And there's a 3 3 lifelinker. Even just a 3 3 lifelinker does matter quite a bit here. Still don't think I eaten by piranhas, knowing that they're running at least one defossilize, they could always have more. Hoverstone Pilgrim, ew. I'm gonna have to eat that by piranhas. Kind of annoying. Cost me four mana because the ward. That's the only way to keep getting damage, and maybe we try to cogwork wrestler the. Echo of Dusk here. It's a really obvious Cogwork Wrestler, though, because of Arena. Well, that's not fun at all. Guess I kind of have to stop the lifelink attack here. Otherwise, they just exile the wrestler from my hand anyway. Yeah. Come on in, Benthasar. Welcome to my face. No, another gargantuan leech. Ah, now we're gonna draw some two twos that are not helpful. Well, if they don't have the removal, six six holds off the lifelink. But I imagine they probably do. Probably should have gotten one ping off Militia with the two wrestlers or the Militia and a wrestler here. But their board state is wide enough. It's worth considering holding up more than two blockers. Wow, what a discover. Oh my god, now the Iceberg has zero power so they can just keep sending the leech into it and gaining five life every turn. Man, they should have had this set come out before Grand Prix Vegas, because this is quite a slot machine roulette kind of set.
Well, they're gonna shut off the siren, so they probably have some other way to deal with the Titan then. Because otherwise, like, you would just shut off the Titan, you'd gain five a turn, so... That easily, easily counteracts the Spyglass Siren. So I think this means Iceberg Titan is not long for this world. At that point. Um, whether or not I have Spyglass Siren as a blocker changes nothing when it has zero power, so we keep setting it in to draw and discard a card. Yeah, I'd rather do that than move the plus one plus one to the Titan, because even a 7-7 seven, seven Titan attacks and trades into one of their two lifelinkers and they gain eight in the process. So yeah, Iceberg Titan's attacks are pretty bad. Don't think Dynatomaton really does anything, but the land does literally nothing, so. Discard the land. Yeah, I mean, even giving the Titan Menace, it's already just getting double blocked anyway. Giving any of these Menace doesn't change much, so. Get this on the board for future attacks. That is a great draw. Yeah, they got all the black cards. No black drafters in their pod. The double Chupacabra Echo with the Defossilizes to reanimate them. This is a very high quality black deck. It's insane. Yeah, I mean, this game's over from here. We're not literally dead. But I, like, go to 1, and they go back up to 16. There's the Sage of Days. One more draw off of the Siren, but I don't think there's anything we draw that... Flips the game from here. Waylaying Pirates is not that card. We've got four blockers on the ground against one, two, three, four, five attackers. One blocker too few. That is game. Really, really solid deck from our opponent. I think we were pretty evenly matched in terms of the power level of our decks. I think our deck is still really, really good. But the hand that we kept doesn't line up well for this kind of matchup at all. As I said, when I kept this hand, this was about one of the slowest hands uh, that our deck would be capable of as an opener, and our opponent is a really powerful late game, like slow grindy deck. So if we're not just steamrolling in with one of the most aggressive hands our deck is capable of, they can really take things over in the long game, and that is exactly what happened here. Just needed to draw into a quicker, more aggressive start to end up winning this one. Gonna start things off 0-1, heading into game two. Here we are again on the play for game two with another really slow hand on average for what this deck is capable of. I mean, we have seven one mana spells and five two mana creatures. So having a curve that's like two drop creature into three drop vehicle into four drop creature I feel like our average opening hand is a lot more aggressive than our first two that we're starting off with today. So, some rough opening draws, but they're not horrible. Like, they're not mulligans or anything, which is nice. Just not the kind of hands we expected the way we built the deck, statistically speaking. Alright, playing against a green deck, probably a deck with stronger late game, as green is a nice, late, rampy kind of color a lot. Tons of good card advantage with Explorer as a mechanic, and yep, green-black, a really good late game deck. 
which is not the matchup we want to draw. One of the slowest hands we could possibly draw. But here we are, running it back two for two against grindy decks with slow keeps. Scavenger there. All right, well, it really is running it back, isn't it? That uh, Carnosaur for the end game here. Let's get our minecart treasure, but also make sure the minecart doesn't just trade into the scavenger by getting that Dinatomaton menace going. And that'll guarantee the Carnosaur next turn, and that might just win us the game here since we did at least hit the lands to cast the Carnosaur this time around. Last game, we kind of just had to get their giant lifelinker off the board. Because even if we had held on to the Carnosaur really aggressively, it took probably four turns from the time we discarded it to have had the mana to cast it. We just did not find the six mana last game. But part of that was discarding lands, because I ended up discarding the Carnosaur anyway. All right, they're not a blue deck, so we know they can't counter this thing. So let's just roll it out pre-combat so we can see what we discover. If we discover a Goblin Tomb Raider, that thing's jamming in. We discover a Zoetic Glyph? And I guess we get to jam in with Minecart without crewing it and discover off of it? When they trade it into their Death Toucher? Alright, they're going to mill two. Well, that's kind of interesting here. Wow. <laughs> I was going to say, statistically speaking, even a 17 creature deck, they probably don't get very good value off of that. They have an empty graveyard, and they're going to go for the mill to reanimate two creatures. I'm actually really curious about that play. I don't know why they wouldn't want to do that after blocking. Like, wouldn't she, like, block the minecart, give the dart frog death touch, then another chance because they can give the frog death touch with its own mana one two mana total up here then post combat another chance and then they're guaranteed at least one creature even if they mill unluckily so yeah if they're blocking in a way where any of their creatures die then it's kind of weird they went for that three blocks and they're gonna block to where both their creatures die i mean it worked well for them it worked perfectly fine for them because they did hit two creatures, but weird to see it in that order. I have definitely done worse, though. I've actually done worse in an arena open draft number two recently. Made some massive misplays, so. We're in some glass houses over here. We are one and one now heading into game three. All right, here we are now for game three with exactly the kind of hand I was thinking of when we built the deck. Beautiful. We've got one drop, two drop, three drop. We've done it. We've accomplished the curve. We are on the draw, so it's not going to be as impressive or explosive as it would be on the play, but it's still going to be very good here. Oak for two, thanks to Sunshot Militia. And then we're just going to throw a glyph onto our map token and really beat down turn three. It's a tinker's tote for some little chumpers on the ground. But that is fine when I've got a 5-4 beaten in and I've got a flyer. Our opponent is down to 11, but they can gain three life off of the tinker's tote. They're on red-white, so they can have plenty of abilities like Sunshot Militia that give them value for tapping a couple of their permanents. The Tinker's Tote being really good in that archetype where they can spit out three permanents off the one spell. So there's a Gem Guard to get a real big blocker by tapping some permanents. So it's big enough to trade into the Glyph here, but we'll discover if they do that. I could Unlucky Drop it here. Is that worth it? I think that's fine. Yeah, let's do it. Just say a big no to that, and I'll have to replay it next turn, and they're just over it. 
We are now two and one, heading into game number four. Here we are for game four with another pretty ridiculous curve. We're going to drop down Wrestler turn one, so we got something to throw the Glyph onto. Then we go Militia, then we go Glyph. I could also just hold off on the Wrestler if I'm really determined to get value off of its Enter the Battlefield effect, and instead just play the Iceberg turn two and put the Glyph on the Iceberg. Just skip a turn. I'm going to play the Island, so I have the option of the Wrestler, but we'll see. I guess it depends on what they play here. Dauntless Dismantler. So our artifacts hit the board tapped and they can blow them up for some amount of mana. I guess at that point I'd rather glyph up an iceberg, right? Because it's harder to kill. They need 5 mana total to sack this to kill a 5-4 iceberg. Because it's mana value 2 instead of 1. Yeah. I think that's fine. Play the iceberg and glyph it up next turn. Ooh, we milled one of our... Pieces of interaction are eaten by piranhas. I mean, we've got the unlucky drops. There's only one more in our deck. There is the the Carnosaur thing. Draw into that. Start slamming in with the glyph. The glyphberg. All right, opponent is racing. We're down to 16, they're down to 15. There's a Clay Fire Bricks to gain a couple life and be a really good card once they hit 7 mana. They flip it into giving their whole board plus and plus 1 and getting 2 more creatures. 2 more 1-1s. One -ones. Cosmium Kiln can do some nasty stuff. Draw into a Goblin Tomb Raider, which is a pretty nice draw. I can play Tomb Raider and Militia and Siren. Play the Tomb Raider and the Militia right now and hold up the Wrestler for if something really weird happens during combat. But if nothing happens, we just Siren post-combat. Yep. I don't think I need to Cogwork Wrestler on the offensive here. All right, they're down to nine. They're at five out of seven mana for the clay-fired bricks, so that's not really going to be a thing at this rate. Kind of have to have, like, the rare board wipe. There's only one board wipe in their color pair, and it is a rare, so it's not very likely. That would be their best way out of this position. Guide Mural is the play for a 4-4 blocker on the ground, and they are not going to attack at all. So, I can unlucky drop the 4-4 so I can keep jamming in with my 5-4. With only one blue source here, I can't Cogwork Wrestler and unlucky drop, which is kind of rough. Only being able to do one of the two. See what our map token finds us, I think. Hmm, a fifth red source? Over a second blue? That's pretty not good. It's pretty not good. Alright, well it's more damage to Unlucky Drop the 4-4 than it is to Cogwork Wrestler the Scout. But I guess I can Cogwork Wrestler the 4-4 also. But... I'd like to have the Cogwork Wrestler to work somewhere else, I think. I think it's pretty reasonable to tap out and just go for the permanent kill on the 4-4. Although Wrestler might end up being better, right? Because you can have Iceberg stick around. No, I think, I think Unlucky Drop is pretty reasonable. I just block with a 1-4 here. Yeah, it doesn't actually do anything. They will chump with the water when scout. Alright. Well, we got the flyer out of here. That's cute.
They're at six out of seven mana now. If they get to the seven, they can flip either of their things. They can get two one ones on the ground and give the whole board plus one plus one, or they can get um, four four flyers. They are going to go ahead and pop our glyph. We get a cogwork wrestler. Let's put it on the board so it attacks next turn. Helping hand the water one scout. Well, that hits the board tapped. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Draw a card, discard a card. Really hope for a blue source here. Dang. Yeah, blue source would have been lethal. I think. No, it would put them to one. One is not zero, but it still would have been very good. Glorifier of Suffering. Crack map. Put a counter on both their creatures, but we've still got Sunshot Militia on board. If this stays, if this stays on the board, they just die to a Sunshot Militia. That's probably the thing. There's the concession. They do die to the Sunshot Militia, so we are 3-1 and one now, heading into Game 5. Alright, here we are now on the play for Game 5. Siren and a crewmate's a great way to start things off. Obviously not having the red source is sketchy, but we have a few map tokens here. One from the Siren and one from the Companion, if I hit any land, to do some digging. Look for some mountains. It's a pirate hat that we can throw on the siren to get attacks in with it, so we'll go for crewmate first. Find Captain Storm. Oh my lord, do I want a mountain? Blue green, there's a poison dart frog. Send in for one. Yikes. Um this map. It's not a bad draw, but I really need those mountains. Pretty cool with crewmate trading into the dark frog here, but they are not going to allow that. So we drop another siren, so we have another map token to do some digging for that mountain. Oh. O'Hare Pockpatik. Insane Mythic Bomb. If they cast any instance, they get to double cast them off the rebound, and even if I kill this... It is going to come back in a few turns. It'll be a land for a little bit, and then it'll come back. So that might just kill us here, because we can't really get through that, and we're still not finding the red source. Fully drawing a card is probably a little better than just using a map here. Mill the island, find the mountain. That is not bad at all. Now, do I map token the Siren to try to get it up to 3-3 stats to slow down the O'Hare? Would it be reasonable? I mean, even if I flip this, then it just ramped them up, right? Like, I buff this to 3-3 stats, and then they just get another land. And after three turns, I guess four turns technically, this will turn back into... The O'Hare. Yeah, that doesn't seem advantageous to me. Just give them an extra mana for a little bit and their mythic back shortly afterwards. Gives them a really good long game grind, but if they have any instance, that's also just an incredible late game grind. Giving them all rebound to cast them twice. It's the Waylaying Pirates to stun our bigger flyer. Use their map token on their Spyglass Siren, finding a Cogwork Wrestler. And they are going to mill that. And they're just going to jam in in the sky. We take 6, go to 12. Find another Goblin Tomb Raider. Actually, would have kind of far prefer to land here.
because being able to play Captain Storm and the Pirate Hat in the same turn would have been pretty awesome. Guess I could still play and equip a Pirate Hat. And if we find a mountain, I can play the Tomb Raider in the same turn. If we find an island, we can at least crap the crap. <laughs> at least crack the map after that. I think we just gotta try to race and maybe find a kill off the Sunshot Militia randomly. Ooh, that ain't mana. Um, four damage, put them down to 12. This thing is nasty. Like the three mana burn spell potentially for slowing that down. If we're really on the backup plan. Yeah, sorry, companion. Companion's really good with Captain Storm, but... Don't have time. Nautilus is a very good blocker on the ground. And Oaken Siren's a great one in the sky. That's going to completely slow us down here. Well, now we see their whole board, which means... By Carnosaur the O'Hare, we know it's going to take them a few more turns before they do anything. We have the blockers for everything they have. I just play a Tomb Raider and hold up the Carnosaur ability... And then we try to, like, get some crazy Captain Storm nonsense going on if we draw well to get our flyers big enough to, to outrace from there, potentially. Guess I can poke for two here. I'm at six life, so I poke for two. I take two on the crackback, but I have this block, this block, this block. Only, I take three, I guess, on the crackback. If I don't kill them before this, like, reflips, I lose regardless. This is definitely bold, but they're playing off the top here. I probably should have done this during their um, untap step. So they couldn't draw into an instant. Because it, it flips transformed and tapped. So I don't want to do it till their turn. But I also would like to do it to where they can't rebound a spell. Luckily they didn't draw an instant anyway. That is still an insanely good draw though. Um, depending on what's on top of their deck. Again, Las Vegas lottery wheel to set strikes again. If they have non-lands on top, we're in a really bad spot. If it's just a couple lands, we're fine. And there's the non-land, so that's a 3-4 Flying Vigilance now, and we're actually taking 5 instead of 3. What a draw. And what a hit off the Explorers. Just another really high variance mechanic. They chose to mill the Sentry and still got rewarded with a second non-land that's even better than the Sentry. Well... They're at 13. I gotta draw so well here.
All right, well, if I have one non-land card on top, then I'll be good here. I'm just hoping for that much luck. I'm not going to hope for two in a row like our opponent got, but if I have one non-land on top, I can juice up one of these Sirens to 4-4 four, four stats, which is massive. All right. Come on, man. One non-land on top. Uh. <sighs> then we could have put pirate hat on the siren and it'd be a 4-4. Four, four. And that shuts off their flying attacks. Still got a 3-3 three, three, so I can block the 2-2-1. Two, two, so they just attack with that and I jump. I guess I can double block. But not if they send both in. If they send both in, I block their chump there. I don't think this roaming throne does anything right now. But it is a 4-4 ward 2 instead of a 3-3 defender, which is still significantly better than their other potential draw. I mean, does it remove multiple counters from this thing? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It can double rebound, but I don't think double rebound actually works, right? So rebound, if you cast it from your hand, exile it, and recast it next turn. Yeah, there's you can't double up a rebound trigger. You can't double exile the same card. Yeah, so they have just nothing that actually works with Roaming Throne right now. Because it doubles triggered abilities. So they probably just choose like Pirate or something in case they draw more Spyglass Sirens. Something like that. Okay. Um, they have no way to put a card into their graveyard at instant speed. I mean, they could sack the Nautilus, I guess. And that would make the Capybara 4 power. Uh, if I'm trying to consider something that I put there as potentially dying. And so we obviously do that. Yeah, the least likely place for Captain Storm to die would be putting Captain Storm there. Because this they can give Death Touch, this they can buff up to trade. If they double buff Nautilus, then they can kill Captain Storm, but then I keep the Tomb Raider. Fairly convinced these are our best blocks. Death Touch the Frog. No buff of the Nautilus, so Captain Storm remains, which is huge. That means I get to make our Spyglass Siren a 4-4 this turn by flipping my Iceberg. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. So, 6-6 six, six on the ground to block the Roaming Throne, chump block the Capybara with a Tomb Raider, and block the Siren with a 4-4. Four, four. So I have to double chump, but they're also double chump attacking at that point. Is that better than playing a Waylaying Pirates right now? I can play a Waylaying Pirates and a Sunshot Militia, get no Captain Storm triggers, but then I stun an Oaken Siren. Then I have a 3-3 to block their 4-3, and I still have to chump the Roaming Throne. No, I think just flipping the Iceberg is best here. See what they draw. Shipwreck Sentry. That is fine. So they pass turn. 
Now I can plundering pirate plus waylaying pirates. That's two more blockers on the ground for five total. And we stun the flyer. Takes two turns to flip this still. They need to remove another counter from it. And then they can transform it the next turn. And the turn that they flip it, it's tapped. So stunning the flyer and jamming for five? Trying to find a two turn kill by jamming for five and then militiaing next turn does seem like the play. And I could also attack with the Iceberg Titan since it can untap itself. I guess what I could do is attack with this and untap the Siren and just have chumps on the ground instead. Then I might not even need to waylaying pirates. And then if they choose to not block, they just die out of nowhere to militia. I don't think they're going to just not block the Titan, though. Right? They're going to double block with a 4-4 four, four, and a 4-3, and I only kill one of the two. Yeah, no, I think I just pirates it up. It's the most consistent play, because it doesn't matter what they do if we do this. Then they just don't have a choice of what they do here. Again, I could send in the Iceberg Titan... I could double block it with a 4-3 and a 3-3 three, three to kill it. Like, it's going to kill their 4-4 four, four, or it trades into two of their cards, so I guess I will actually do that. I guess I play around them getting flying out of nowhere. I don't know what there could be to do that in blue-green, but... This is the hardest discard. <laughs> I mean, Sunshot Militia is just straight up lethal next turn. Because we're hitting for 5, they're going to 8. Next turn we hit for 5, they go to 3. 1, 2... I guess Militia isn't lethal if the Iceberg Titan dies. Unlucky Drop is a three-turn kill instead of a two-turn kill, but it's safer against them dropping like a Reach creature. They drop a Reach creature, and I'm not killing them with Militia next turn anymore. Or they drop a Flyer, and I'm not doing it. I hate my life. <laughs> I'm gonna keep Unlucky Drop. All right. The one for one trade it is. They have three attackers on the ground against our four blockers on the ground and one in the sky. Got the unlucky drop for the siren. Going for the two turn kill now. Final counter is removed from the temple, so they'll get their tapped 4-3 flyer next turn. Twists and turns doesn't do... well, it explores. That is something. Doesn't do a lot here, though. I mean, I could unlucky drop into just lethal this turn. I guess, since they didn't hit a creature. We know they have no cards in hand. So yeah, no, we actually still just find Lethal with Unlucky Drop, just like we would have with the... with the other thing. Oh, and Dynatomaton too? I'm pretty sure that also finds Lethal. But Unlucky Drop is, like, definitely. They have no cards in hand. The only ability they have on board is Nautilus. 
If I get rid of one of their ground troops, they block two creatures on the ground, and that's it. So they block the two three threes and take five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Unlucky drop and hit for nine it is. insanely close game of magic there sitting there on one life for several turns against that mythic god potentially flipping back but we are going to find a victory there and that's going to push us into the mythic rank a lot of lottery wheel spins there as well some pivotal explorers from our opponent and ourselves some pivotal top decks draws and discards high variant stuff there too Crazy game of magic, and we are now four and one heading into game six. All right, here we are for game six. Do I keep this hand? Am I that greedy? I mean, pirate for the treasure token means we cast one of these blue one drops, even if we don't hit an island. Was I born a gambling man? One in Vegas. That's the theme of today's draft. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. A lot of discovering and exploring and stuff. Let's just go full gamble town. On the draw means that we are one card closer to drawing into the island than we would be keeping this on the play, which is the tiniest little increment towards keeping this. Our opponent's on a great grindy color pair. Blue-black can have really good late games, so having a slower hand like this definitely can be an issue. But if we hit an island turn one, it would have been a really fast hand, so. All right, Sage of Days, fill that graveyard. Get those Descend cards turning. Get them doing some wild stuff. Might want to drop Minecart turn three if I don't hit the island by then. Because that would mean I get to make two treasure tokens next turn. Guaranteed I get to play the pirate, crew the minecart, have double treasure, and cast two of these spells, which is huge. Plus, the first treasure I get from the minecart or the pirate means that I have the mana for Cogwork Wrestler to make sure... Uh, Dinatomaton. To make sure the minecart survives the, uh, the blocks they try to set up for it. Now, I think it's still going to be a good block for our opponent, because these kind of descend decks still want to fill their graveyard with plenty of permanence. So... They block with the uh, Sage of Days. It still puts another permanent in there, which is good. All right, they got the Mythic Uncommon Zoetic Glyph, and now we might just be dying too fast, especially because we still have not found the blue card. Still have not found the blue source. That is certainly awkward. So, good lord, I take a lot of damage on the crack back. Double treasure so I can double blue spell. I mean, at this point, I might have to just try to River Herald Scout into a land. And then use the Scout to crew the mine cart. If it's not a land, Scout will be a 2-3 and I can double block a 5-power creature. So I could double block the draft. If I don't get a treasure. Feel like it's better to get a treasure. We get a treasure here, and then we have Cogwork Wrestler win the fight against the Sage of Days. Take five, go to seven, and start going from there. That's pretty annoying.
I guess I could crew the minecart and sack that instead. But at this point, we just don't know when we're hitting the blue source, so we probably have to keep the minecart around. So we have a guaranteed way to keep casting blue spells. We're getting Donkey Kong Country up in here. I like those special missions in Spyro, those things were frustrating. Like, you're a little flying dragon that can fire breathe and stuff, and they shove you in a minecart for some missions? Come on. Nobody wants to do that. Alright. Puzzle door for mana efficiency. Ooh, boy. Um... Well, we're probably going to waylaying pirates the draft now. Like, I guess I can still hold up for double blocks on it, but if it dies, they discover and draw a card. They actually just get immense value, so just stunning it seems super reasonable to me. And the pirates is a 3-3 on blocks, so we can send in with everybody so that we're th trying to keep the pressure up here. I have a feeling they may just trade into the minecart at this point. I really don't want that to happen, but they might think that is the best play. They don't do that, so we keep our blue source around, which is a big deal. I guess also if they did trade into the minecart, we would not have had an artifact left on board for the stun from the waylaying pirates, which would have been really bad. So I'm really happy they didn't take the trade there. Gives us the slightest chance of outracing them. They're down to 10. They do lose a life if we ever kill the Mephitic draft. <laughs> 10 life here. I can't imagine I can afford to not block this. Like, it's obviously tempting, because if they have literally no follow-up, we're cracking back for 9 damage. But 9 is not 10. This thing could be unblockable, which would be terabad. Probably need to start chumping the draft every turn and trying to find crackbacks, but that's hard against a 4 toughness card. Definitely the pirate is not sending in, but the minecart can, so maybe we craft the minecart, send in a 2-3 and a 3-3, get a chump blocker off any of these. Still kind of anyone's game, which is surprising. They're definitely ahead, but this is not looking as bad for us as it was early, and especially not as bad for us as it probably should be stuck on four mountain zero islands. So I think our deck is still doing some oppressive work, even if it does get the L in the end. Two blockers up, so they have to have two removal spells to kill us. Poke for two so that we might be able to find some kind of lethal crackbacks with Militia plus Dynatomaton combo. Where we get a menace attack in that they weren't expecting and we just tap everybody to ping them. I think that feels like our best bet. Poke in for two damage here and then maybe... Maybe find an absurd amount of damage later, somehow. If I play the Siren, I can insta-crack the treasure, which is pretty nice. Or insta-crack the uh, map token. 
play the Water Wind Scout, it's just more mana efficient, which is nice, and it's a bigger attacker to have on board next turn, which might matter. Certainly a hard choice either way, as its own upsides. I'm gonna get the bigger attacker for the potential crackback. If we make it there. I can't afford to do any militia taps or I die to removal. Okay, we're dead to double removal or some kind of unblockable trick on the Mephitic Draft, but I don't think there is an unblockable trick in this format. Obviously, they can make the Cave Diver unblockable just by exploring, but... That is not seven damage. Chart a course to draw two and discard a card. Going for the pre-combat chart, probably seeing if they can find lethal before they declare any attacks. Ever flowing well, mill two, draw two. All right, they're tapped out. But if we don't kill them in like one turn, this ever flowing well is popping off. It's flipping and then anything they cast, they get to turn another permanent into a copy of that. Right, so they just turn one of their lands into whatever creature they cast and just beat me down with haste, basically. So no attacks is the play. We've got this one opportunity to try to find lethal. They are at 8 life. I don't think it's happening. Especially without the island. With the island... Getting the Siren on board. Obviously, we wouldn't have drawn the Captain Storm if we drew an island instead. But getting the Siren on the board and trying to use that map for extra damage could be a thing. Okay. So, I mean, it's just all in, in the sky, isn't it? I guess I can guarantee that Water Wind Scout... Hold up, if I... Hmm. We're hitting them for two in the sky... Dynatomaton to give one of our three power creatures menace, making the minecart crude off of this thing, means they block a three and a two and take three, so they take five total. Five is not eight. Five is really not eight damage. I think we have to just play it defensive here. Can't even send the minecart... Yeah, I, I can't even afford to send in the minecart. Where I have just less blockers. Oh my god. You know what? Hopefully this is just still enough blockers. I'm going to get the mana. And so they double block that. And kill it, and I don't kill anything. I mean, the attack isn't even that good. It just gives me a treasure. To play the Siren. But having another flyer is good. Good enough to just trump attack with the minecart. I'm going to do it. I don't know if it is, but I'm going to do it. Another flyer is a big game. Alright, let's see if they kill me with this Myriad Pools thing. Man, we were like two damage or something off from lethal if we just went all in. But then obviously we're guaranteed dead on the crack back if we do that so we've got to leave ourselves the chance of being around here getting one more turn yeah this game was mega close even with zero islands however it ends up I'm 
All right. Our Sunshot Militia is just a 1-1. One, one. Oh, that does not work how they want it to. I am so happy. Oh my god. That Myriad Pools could have been way worse for us, but they tried to duplicate an aura. And you don't get to choose what the aura is enchanting um, outside of when you cast it. So turning a Tithing Blade into an aura just makes it die because it doesn't it's not enchanting anything since they didn't actually cast it. Definitely really rough for our opponent there, because that is kind of a specific little interaction. And it is easy to get wrong. But it helps us quite a bit, so obviously we're we're gonna take it. They've still shut off the militia, so they're not dying to militia pings. We still might be able to find lethal if they can only play like one more blocker or something. Whale of the Forgotten. Bounce one of our cards, make us discard a card. Ooh. That is pretty gross here. Guess I gotta just discard Captain Storm at this point and really hope for an island, because either way I can't cast my spell unless I hit an island. Might as well keep the flyer. Come on, island. <laughs> so if they have no instance and I attack with everyone, they can double block this and take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Or they can block this and block this and take one, two, three, four, five, six. Just go for that onboard lethal. I guess we see if Arena's holding at all. Arena is holding. They probably have something here. Oh. Uh... I mean, with this myriad pools. Oh, God. With this myriad pools, it feels like even if I just go the conservative route and just attack with the siren, I could very well just die next turn regardless. And this takes three turns to kill him if I just do that. Just all attack and hope that it's like graveyard recursion and not a hard removal spell. Because there's a common graveyard recursion spell for two and a black that it could be. It's a bounce spell or a removal spell. We just straight die. If I just attack with the siren and it's just a removal spell, they're going to kill the siren and still win the game over time. So if it's exactly a bounce spell, it's better to just poke with Siren over and over, I guess. But even then, because I don't have the blue source, because I don't have the blue source, I feel like if it's a bounce spell, I also just lose. They bounce the Siren, and then I have two cards I can't cast stuck in my hand. We started this game with a gamble. Let's end it with a gamble. All in. I don't think trying to chip in for two a turn, three turns in a row is going to play well against any of the instants that would stop us from lethaling them here either. Oh my god, okay. We do find the kill. In the end, we are now five and one in the money out of this draft. No islands, no problem. That minecart being the absolute MVP as we head into game seven. Here we are now on the play for game seven. We've got some Tomb Raiders to haste out turn two. If I had a, a volcanic island here, then I could turn one wrestler and turn two double Tomb Raider and attack with all three for five damage on turn two. 
but uh, obviously there's no untapped red and blue source in this format. So I think we have to just go Tomb Raider turn one and turn two. We play a wrestler and a Tomb Raider together and just hit for four on turn two. Which is still good. And then we minecart and hope to draw some spells. And that's the game. There's a dead weight on one of the Tomb Raiders, still poking in for three a turn. We find an inverted iceberg, which is a spell, so it is a good draw. Not as good as jamming out the minecart for now. Start beating down with a 3-3 minecart instead of a 1-2 wrestler. Although, now they've got a plundering pirate to find the block there, so we want to see if we can draw into interaction off the iceberg. So that the minecart doesn't just trade into pirate. No! How are we gonna mill the trumpeting carnosaur? That's so sad. Oh, it's so sad. Find a waylaying pirates? Well, that's a solid draw. Alright. Kill my minecart and take three, or kill my wrestler without losing a creature. It's your choice, opponent. I'm fine either way. Because you're already down to 13, taking five more damage if you kill the wrestler. We've got a 6-6 six, six coming up thanks to our treasure token. Alright, they're going to keep the pirate around. Take more damage, go to 8 here. There's a geological appraiser, which is a huge, huge way to stabilize, because it discovers, so it can hit two creatures off the one card, but discovers a fanatical offering, which doesn't give them another blocker, so that is nice for us. But they had the treasure left behind to actually cast that still, so it's definitely not terrible for our opponent, but they certainly would have preferred a blocker here, I imagine. Um, Don't really care too much to stun a 3-2 when I can stun something bigger later, and I've got the mana to spit out a 6-6 six, six instead this turn. So let's just spit out a 6-6 six, six and let the minecart trade off. Got plenty of mana and treasures. Yeah. And I guess we do this uh, pre-combat so we can attack with three creatures again. And actually poke for some damage here, even if everything else trades off. But we are a pretty big fan of the 3-2 stat line. Our one drop trades up into three twos. Alright, so they are down to six, and they've got no more blockers on board, but they've got plenty in hand. We've got a way to stun one blocker, and we have a six power creature on board if they don't have hard removal. Like an abrade to destroy target artifact, or a join the dead, or whatever. For minus uh, ten, minus ten. Since they do have... F well, they have three permanents in grave. They actually can't minus ten, minus ten right now. They can only minus five, minus five, which isn't enough to kill the titan. If they have that common removal spell. Kind of looks like they might have that, because they're like looking at their caves, looking at their map. Maybe trying to find a way to put another permanent in the grave. But in the end, they do just concede, and we're now 6-1. and one, one win away from the maximum prize out 7-win run. Really nice stuff. We're now heading into the final battle with two rounds in the chamber. Here we are now on the play for the final boss. No one drop, none of our seven little one mana dorks, but starting things off with turn two crewmate is still very nice. We're gonna keep the hand. It's got both the colors as well, which is huge. Playing against a white deck, we find a belligerent yearling. Actually gonna drop out a 3-2 trample first just to maximize our damage output. And it's possible we can crewmate into a one-drop pirate and play crewmate and whatever we draw off of it in the same turn if we hit one of our little goblin pirate dorks. Is crewmate still the best play when I have a companion in hand here? It's obviously less mana efficient. 
if I don't hit a one drop exactly. But I think it's still very reasonable. I'm going to go for it. Never didn't have it. Never didn't have it. So blue-white from our opponent, they've got all the goodies, the cheap little flyers like the Flying Vigilance card, the 2-2 flyer that makes a map, and now they can crack the map off of the Flying Vigilance card because it taps for mana for it, but they're going to choose not to. They'd rather hold up some blocks here, which is reasonable. We can put an artifact onto our board for our Goblin Tomb Raider. We can also play and equip the Pirate Hat if we want to. We're playing a Minecart, a Companion, or a Pirate Hat because we're definitely putting an artifact on this board. So if they chose not to crack that map, this is 100% a cogwork thing for minus two, minus zero on blocks, which would kill any of our creatures for free no matter how I attack. So do I just set up? To have interaction up next turn guaranteed by getting a minecart for treasures on our next attack? I think so. I'm gonna guess they could also be just holding for a double block. Yeah, Arena's not holding for them at all. Maybe they don't have the cogwork thing. If they do have the cogwork thing, it only wins one of these combats anyway, so I guess it's not the absolute end of the world. Alright, there you are, just stopping damage. Cool stuff. We are fine with those trades. Now here's an adaptive gem guard. They're just going to make it a 4-4 immediately. Yep. Okay, we're pretty happy to have an unlucky drop against that. Now we can Waterwind Scout crew and attack with a minecart here. Could also Militia crew and attack and play the Pirate Hat in the same turn to double spell. I think I'd rather get a Flyer again though. Our opponent's down to nine. They have no flyers left on the board to block our water wind scout damage. There's a Tinker's Tote for plenty of blockers on the ground, and they get to gain three life off of it by sacrificing it. They also get to buff the gem guard even more, but we're really happy with our unlucky drop against that thing. I mean, do I just do it? I can unlucky drop it and... Sorry. I can unlucky drop it, crew the minecart, attack both. They just get a chump block. And then we have two mana left over post combats to cast a sunshot militia off the treasures. I feel like I do want to do that. And they are going to shove it to the bottom. They're down to six now, but they have six mana up. They can cast multiple spells towards stabilizing as well as sacking that tote to gain three.
Guardian of the Great Door is a big one. 4-4 four, four Flyer to block the Waterwind Scout. And there's the Petrify to stop the Sunshot Militia from pinging them. But we can crew the Minecart with it still. Can we actually find Lethal here off Dynatomaton? No, but we can put them to 1. Which I suppose is worth it. I mean, they block the Minecart... If I have a non-land card on top of my deck, I can find lethal. No, I would still put them to one. Well, no, no, I can with Pirate Hat. Pirate Hat and the map token. Mm, let's see. Map token, non-land card, non-land card. It's a land, so we don't find lethal. Because I can't have a 3-3 scout and pirate hat the Tomb Raider to also be a 3-3. To where they block the minecart takes 6. Okay, well... I'm still just going to put them to one here, and I'll keep the Dynatomaton for later. Ooh, that's a great draw. They probably do gain the tote life now, though, so they're at four. I mean, I've been saying that every turn. But eventually, they're going to run out of expensive stuff to do and crack the tote. And have more breathing room. Crack the courtyard, and they do have the one white up for the Tinker's Tote. Ooh, and they hit a Saw Blades too to kill the Waterwind Scout. It's a pretty good roulette spin there off the Discover ability. Crack the Tote to be at four life. I actually have exactly enough mana to lethal them here, though. Because we can do... well... No, they have two blockers up, so we can't kill them. I can crew a minecart and put a pirate hat on it and dynatomaton it to give it menace, so they have to double block so we can kill the guardian there and let the spyglass siren get in. Is that better than just playing a carnosaur? Carnosaur can't shoot their face. That would be really awesome here if it could, but it can't. I feel like that is still a pretty good turn. Trade the minecart into the guardian. Keep the flyer around and get a damage off it. Now we have two evasive threats, a menace creature and a flyer. We've got a removal spell in hand with the Carnosaur. We've got a map token and a pirate hat on board for some buffing, potentially. The pirate hat guaranteed the map token if there's an on land on top of our deck. Try 
discard a course to draw two and discard one. And they pass when we have lethal on board. Non-land on top, please. Okay. It's a non-land on top. It's two lethal threats attacking in. They need double removal or life gain of some kind. There is the concession from our opponent. That is a seven win run with this really sweet blue red pirates deck. Some pretty nasty stuff all around. Great, really aggressive curve. Some of the games did awkwardly go a lot slower than we expected, but some of them were about as explosive as we thought with like double Tomb Raider in the first couple turns. Some spyglass sirens early, some cogwork wrestlers to ruin combat, some. Pretty nasty stuff out of the deck in general, just all of the premium blue and red commons showing off and uh, and doing what they're best at here. Just really powerful, really nice deck, not too much to say about it. We're getting late enough into the format that we have played pretty much all these cards before and, uh, and to great use. We've experienced them all quite a few times. And yeah, deck was sweet. Deck was sweet. Low on interaction, but if you got a quick enough curve, and enough ways to get around their creatures with flyers and menace cards and stuff like that. Sometimes that just does not matter, and you can still pull out those seven win runs, grabbing 2,200 gems and six packs for the prizes. But that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and YouTube members for their support, as well as you for watching the video. If you enjoyed this video and you're interested in seeing more, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more in your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.